You were convicted of 39 felonies for cybercrime, placed on the U.S. most wanted list in 2006, escaped from prison. You built the first organized cybercrime community called Shadow Crew that is the precursor to today's Darknet and Darknet markets. And for all this, the U.S. Intelligence Service called you the original internet godfather. So first question, how did your career as a cybercrime criminal begin? My life of crime begins when I'm 10 years old. 10 years old, man. Think about that. I mean, I, you were probably playing with robots when you were 10. Mm-hmm. You know, usually kids are doing the Lego bit, getting involved with sports, everything else. And uh, with me, it wasn't like that. With me, I'm, I'm from Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky is one of these, um, it's like parts of Texas, parts of Louisiana, that uh, if you're not fortunate enough to have a job, you may be involved in a scam, hustle, fraud, whatever you want to call it, man. I was, uh, my parents, my mom was basically the captain of the entire fraud industry. So uh, this is a this is a woman that at one point she's stealing a 108,000 pound Caterpillar D9 bulldozer, <laughs> tramming it down the road. You know, at another point she's taking a slip and fall in a convenience store trying to sue the owner. We had a neighbor she acted as a pimp for at one point. That's my mom. Uh, my dad. Wait, wait. The neighbor acted as a pimp. My mom prostituted. I mean, she she acted as a pimp for a neighbor. Um, her name was Debbie and. Uh, my mom used to sell her out. You know, Debbie needed money, and my mom would find men for her to sleep with for cash, and she'd take a, a part of the cash. So it sounds like she diversified the methodologies by which she uh, hustled. Very, had that entrepreneurial spirit. Okay. <laughs> you know, we, so, <laughs> we, we see that a lot with uh, with cyber criminals, you know, that uh, that sense of being that entrepreneur. So what was the motivation, you think, for her? Is it uh, Is it money? Is it basically the uh, the rush of playing with the system of being able to um, know the rules and break the rules and get away with it? My mom's a complex character. She is. There's no one single motivation. So my mom was the individual. She's still alive. My mom was the individual who tested people. She, she wanted to know how far she could abuse you and you come back and still love her. So, and that was with every relationship she's ever had. Um, she would cheat on the men she was involved with. She would abuse the uh, her children, me and Denise. She would... Uh, um, Psychological, physical? Oh, it was mental, emotional, physical, um, everything, everything. I mean, she... Uh, she used to beat me and Denise with, uh, with belt buckles, you know, and, uh, and that ended <laughs> when uh, she was... I forgot what we had done. It wasn't much. I think that uh, um, it may have been the part where she she accused me of stealing her marijuana, but uh, she was hitting me and Denise. We were living in a single wide trailer at that point. She was hitting me and Denise. We were we were on the bed trying to get away from it, and Denise kicks her through a closet. Is what happens, and uh, Denise stands up and she said, uh, "You're through hitting me." And that was the last time that mom hit us at that point. But um, so sorry to take us there. You're uh, for people who know you, and people should definitely watch some of your lectures online. You're extremely charismatic Thanks. and fun and uh, jolly, and whatever <laughs> word you want to use. But you know, if we look at that kind of life, it's there's darkness there. There's uh, struggle there. There's Is a lot it, of darkness. So. If you, if you, how did you feel if you go back to the mind of the kid you were with your mom? Was, um, was there sadness? Was there things like depression, self doubt, all those kinds of things? Or did you see this crime, this chaos as ultimately exciting? You know, I, I don't think uh, back then I didn't view it as exciting. Now it becomes exciting when I start being involved in cyber crime, cyber crime. All right, but back then it was simply a means to an end. Was all it was. So you, you take a ten year old kid, and the way I get involved in crime is, like I said, my, my mom was the fraudster. My dad was my dad was a good guy. He just forgot he was this good guy. You know, he was always he always had these principles, but his issue was is he loved my mom so much he was scared of the, of her leaving. So if she wanted to do something, commit crime, cheat on him, whatever, he would pretty much just put up with it. Um, the, the one instant 
So, I mean, I, this woman used to, she used to bring men home in front of him, tell him that, hey, I'm leaving you. I don't love you anymore. I want you to die, blah, 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 blah. This was my mom. Um, there were two instances where the man, where he can't take it anymore. And the first instance, I was, I guess I was seven or eight. My sister Denise is a year younger than I am. My dad actually files for divorce, files for divorce at that point. My mom um, kind of goes crazy. Uh, my dad, I was with my dad. My, my sister was with my mother because that's that Eastern Kentucky mentality. You know, men stay with men, women stay with women. So um, he was filing for divorce. Me and my dad, we were living in an apartment. My mom was living with... Uh, with her grandparents and with her parents bouncing back and forth between the two. And I remember I was sleeping in the bed. We had a single wide bed. My dad slept on, on the sofa. I woke up one night and there was some sort of ruckus in the living room. So I wake up and I walk into the living room and my mom has a knife to my dad's throat. And basically you're not going to steal my son from me. My mom was this individual that when she knew she went so far, like I said, she was always this person that tested well, can I do this to you? And you'll still come back. She knew she, she was always also this person that if she went too far, she knew it and she would always try to divert that into something else. All right. So she knew at that point she'd went too far. So what does she do? She gets up crying, goes to the bathroom and pretends to slit her wrists so that my dad, Ray, will respond to that, not respond to what she's just done to him. Mm -hmm. That was my mom in a nutshell. She had a history of doing this kind of stuff. Um, motivations as far as fraud with her, I think with her, it was, uh, she was an LPN. She had uh, an, a very good nurse, but she didn't want to work was a lot of it. So, uh, so with her, it was easier for her to commit fraud. And when I say commit fraud, it, it was against businesses, against people. I remember at one point she's, uh, she's buying over the counter capsules and emptying the capsules out and putting some other crap in, in there, in there and selling it at a speed and people are buying it. Uh, this, she did anything she could for money. And of course I get involved with that. What happens is, is my, we were in East, we were in Panama city at that point, And, uh, my mom leaves my dad and the way she left my dad, my great grandfather had died. My mom tells all three of us, Hey, I'm, we're going, I'm taking the kids and we're going back to Eastern Kentucky to attend the funeral. Mm -hmm. Well, that was her leaving. Me and Denise didn't know she didn't pack in any of our clothes at all. She stows her clothes in the trunk of the, of the car and she leaves my dad and I don't get to see my dad again for, I think five, six years, something like that. My mom, like I said, she used to bring men home in front of my dad. She would, uh, He'd sit there and cry and beg her not to do it. She'd do it anyway. When she leaves him, she kept up that. So we were um, we were living at my grandparents' house. My grandfather, he had converted the house. He had raised the house up and built apartments underneath of it. So me and my sister and my mom lived in one of the apartments underneath. And uh, that whole side of the family was just nuts, was nuts. My, my granddad, Paul, he would... <laughs> This, this is a man that uh, he didn't want you to eat any of his food. So, you know, there was no such thing as me and Denise going upstairs to eat. If he found out me and Denise were, was taking a bath, we were allowed to bath and bathe in two inches of water one time a week because he didn't want to have to pay the water bill. There's rules. There's rules. You know, if uh, you, you couldn't have the TV on. It, when he went to bed at night, you had to have the television, the volume, you could watch it, but without volume. Because if he heard it, he would he would get up in the middle of the night and he would kick the power breaker, turn off all the power on you. This is my, this is my, the family, right? So my mom, she used to leave me and Denise at home for, uh, for days, man, for days. She'd go out and, you know, party. And, uh, I mean, sometimes she'd take me and Denise with her. We'd wait in the car. Sometimes we had uh, wait in the living room as she went and partied and everything else. Most of the time she left, left us at home and um, my entry into crime. Denise walks in one day. She's, she's nine years old, man. She walks in one day and she's got a pack of pork chops in her hand and uh, looked at her and I said, where'd you get that? And she's like, I stole it. And, you know, it's like, show me how you did that. So she takes me over and she shows me how she steals food, how she's stuffing it down her pants. 
So we start stealing food. I'm like, hell yeah, let's do that shit. So uh, start stealing food and we get to the point where we're wanting a sandwich. Well, you can't stuff a loaf of bread down your pants. So there was a Kmart in the shopping center. I go over to, to the Kmart, get a hoodie off the, uh, off the rack, take the tags off of it, wear it out, work just fine. And the way you steal bread is you put the hoodie over your shoulder, stuff a loaf of bread down the sleeve, and you walk out with it. So we started doing that. How'd you figure that out? Just thought pattern. So, you, like, so there's, there's like strategic thinking here. Yeah, you know, you can't lot- wear the hoodie and put the bread down here because you might mash the bread. When you zip it up, or they yeah, might we have to think the through that. You got to think through it, okay. but but you got to realize by by this point, I'm hell, I'm already seeing what my parents are doing. You know, I'm already seeing so, <laughs> so so that plotting. That kind of puzzle solving was something you already developing yourself oh, yeah. individually because oh, you're yeah. pretty young. Yeah, I'm ten years old, pretty young. But but seeing how they act, how they respond to things, and and my mom, I guess you could call it a good thing. She they never kept any of that hidden. From the kids. Yeah. You know, there was no no discussions behind closed doors. All that happened in front of everybody. And from your young mind's perspective, seeing that kind of crime, you basically, you know, a lot of us kind of grow up thinking there's rules you're not supposed to break. If you see other humans breaking those rules, then th- you realize those rules are just human made. It, but it gets worse than that. You, I was in an environment where there were no decent people. I didn't really meet my first decent person until I was 16 years old. Who was that? That was a uh, high school teacher. So what happens is, is, um, you know, we start shoplifting food. My mom finds out that we've been stealing stuff and, you know, she joins us. What's what, that? She joins us. She jo- Yeah, she comes in. You know, I've got the television. I've got the Atari 2600 play the hell out of it. Oh, my God. And she starts seeing this shit. She's like, where'd this come from? And I'm like, well, we found it. She's like, you didn't find that. Denise. Denise stands up. We stole it. My mom, show me how you did that. And she gets her mom, too, to join in. And she used to run me and Denise as these little shoplifters. We'd take, uh, you know, we'd steal stuff for her. We would uh, distract security. And her and my grandmother would steal stuff. Um, They got caught doing that. But that's that's the entry into crime. And Denise, you know, I'm I'm, I'm adamant. And I kind of mean it. (laughs) <laughs> but the the truth is, I say, and I, I I do I do mean it that I'm responsible for my choices as an adult. All right, I, I believe that when you're a child, you can't control that. The adults in your environment control what you do. Yeah. All right, once you're an adult, though, your choices are yours. Now that being said, there there's some you can't dismiss that childhood influencing what I did as an adult. You can't do that. I mean, it, it was kind of written on on slate that, hey, this guy's going to be this guy when he grows up. That said, like sometimes that one person you meet, that decent person can turn the tide of your life. Absolutely. So what happens is, is, you know, the abuse, everything continues on. When I'm 15, my dad was in, uh, was in Panama City, Florida. My mom was in, uh, you know, we were in Hazard, Kentucky. She, um, she was dating this guy. She, and, and my mom was this guy, this woman that, uh, the abuse would, it was, it was crazy abuse, man. Just crazy stuff. You, she would, uh, tell me and my sister, you know, that, uh, she gave up her life for us, that, uh, she was going to leave one day and never come back, that we'd find her dead in a ditch someplace. She'd go out and date these men and she'd come back and she'd talk about how these men were abusing her. You know, so she'd be dating this guy and uh, she'd come back and, and she'd, you know, start talking about how he had tried to rape her, you know, trying to get me to respond to that. And I would respond to that. Make no doubt I would respond to that. Well, what happens is, and I knew that, uh, I don't know if I knew it was abuse at that age. All right. But I knew things were fucked up. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to my dad in, in Panama City and, and I really had it in my head that, uh, that I was going to go down and live with my dad. And, uh, I called my dad one day, I was set to go to, uh, me and my cousins were going to go see uh, return of the Jedi that had come out again in the theaters. So I called my dad. It was a Sunday I called my dad and he told me he, he had either gotten married or he was about to get married to this woman. And, uh, basically Brett Johnson wasn't going to go down to Florida. You know, I was going to, I was going to stay in hazard. I had to call my dad from a payphone, but the result of that was uh, I walked into a uh, 
into a hospital, got in an elevator, and a woman got in the elevator at the same time, and I snapped and beat the hell out of her right there. And uh, I was 15. Didn't really know what the fuck happened. Didn't really know. But uh, just anger came from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the elevator beat the hell out of this lady. Turned out she looked a shitload like my mom. But um, the elevator doors open. One of the security guards, I played basketball with with his son. So he he saw me immediately. I, I knocked the hell out of him, took off running, made it back to the house where my, where my granddad, grandparents were. They didn't know what had happened, so um, I didn't say anything. About an hour later, Kentucky State Police, they pull up in the front yard. And uh, two of them get out, and I'm sitting on the front porch, and me and my cousins are, and they start walking up. Everybody starts walking out of the house. And I'm like, I just remember saying, what do you want? What do you want? Well, you know what they wanted. They wanted to, to arrest Brett Johnson. And, I, and they arrested me. I went in and I, I told them everything. Um, spent three months in a, in a county jail. They didn't have um, juvenile facilities in that county. So I spent three months in solitary. Went to trial. Uh, pled guilty to assault in the first degree. The uh, The judge sentenced me to time served and a psychological evaluation where they sent me to um, Louisville, Kentucky and spent 30 days up there. They cut me loose. They wanted me to uh, have counseling after that and uh, never went to counseling. You know, wanted to, but mom was like, don't need it. And uh, so never went to counseling and uh, I became this pariah in the county. Uh, it's, it's crazy, man. I, I mean, uh, not a day goes by that I don't think about that, that. That moment in the elevator. Yeah. And and what happens is, is uh, you know, you're 15. Fuck, man, you're 15. So I go back to the, uh, the high school that I was in, and um, I'm this piece of shit. So everybody, everybody you're not the outcast. Everybody knows. So I moved. We moved. We were in, we were in Whitesburg at that point. I finished up the year there and moved to uh, back to Perry County, where, where which is where Hazard is. So we moved there, and they've got three high schools there. They've got MC Napier, they've got Hazard High School, and then they've got Dills Combs High School. So um, I was within. Me and Denise were within half mile of MC Napier. Show up there the first day of school. And I met uh, me and my mom and my sister were walking into the school, and the kids won't let me in. The kids stand out there. He's not coming in. So uh, my mom starts raising hell, and I'm like, no, let's just go. Let's go. So from there, it was uh, we went down to the city school, Hazard. And the principal tells my mom, Denise can come. He can't. So uh, my mom wants to raise hell, and I'm like, no. Let's just uh, just take me to this other school. So this other school was like 15 miles away. And, uh, you know, country, country school, country high school. So I go there and they accept me. And I walked in the first day and uh, this English teacher named Carol Combs. I walked in and uh, handed her the paper. I, she was my homeroom teacher. And she heard this voice, as, as the way she explains it today. She heard this voice. And she looks up and she was like, uh, son, have you ever done any drama before? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no, ma'am, but I'm interested in the academic team. I was this quick recall guy, right? And uh, she's like, no. She's like, uh, drama. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm not interested in theater. I'm interested in in." Academics. Well, she was the head of the drama department and head of the academics department. So the deal was, tell you what, you can get on the academics team if you start with theater, too. And I was like, OK. So uh, what happens is she was the only she was the first decent person I met in my life. And uh, she became this kind of surrogate mother to me. So under her tutelage, 
I become the uh, one of the top academic team guys in the state. Uh, around there, I was captain of the team. I was this this just just scourge across all the counties in that part of Kentucky. If you know, if we had a had a meet, it was like Jesus Christ, that's Brett Johnson. <laughs> and, you know, it was like <laughs> she used to tell people they would. The the high school that I came from was Whitesburg, and the first time that Whitesburg came against us, uh, she told she told me I was I was talking to her about a year ago, and uh, she told me she's like Brett. Uh, she said that first meet against Whitesburg, she said uh, the captain came in, looked at you, and said, "Oh, you've got that Johnson boy on your team," and she said my response was that Johnson boy is our team. <laughs> so. But I uh, did that, and then with uh, with theater, I ended up uh, my senior year. I won Best Actor and Actress in the state. Only guy to ever do that in the state. So um, did pretty well, man. Did pretty well. Had uh, had scholarships coming out of, out of high school and everything else, and I'm the idiot that turned them down. Ask you a funny question. Yeah. You'd make a hell of a, I mean, of all the many things you could probably do, you, you'd make a hell of a actor. I'm very good on stage. I'm very good on stage. Have you acted professionally anywhere or not? I, not not professionally. We've done the you know the college circuit and stuff like that. What happened was is uh, so I turned down the um, turned down the scholarships. You know, scared of leaving. I guess is what it was. Start starting community college, and um, the community college there hires a new theater director out of California. Well, he knew the guy that ran the San Jose State Theater Program. A uh, guy named Edward Emanuel was his name. His claim to fame, he had written the Three Ninjas movie. Remember that? The Three Little Ninja Kids mm-hmm. back in the 80s? He had written this for damn film, and it had made a shitload of money. Mm-hmm. So um, he invites Ed Emanuel to come down and see the play, and Ed had written this uh, Civil War piece. So um, we put that on. I was doing like, it was a multiple role thing. I was doing like 18 different roles in the show. So Ed sees the show and he's like, scholarship he said look he said right now you're a big fish in a small pond we'll make you a big fish in a big pond and Mm -hmm. i was like deal so i took the scholarship man and he was like i'll be back in two weeks so he flies out two weeks later this guy flies back in he he drives down to where we're where i'm living i'm out shooting ball with uh, with with my cousins and friends he pulls up and he gets out of the car and i was like i'm walk over to him i was like hey man i'll Walk in, you can meet my parents. He's like, "No, nah, I can, I got it." I was like, "Okay." So I keep shooting ball. He walks in the house, stays about fifteen minutes, walks out white as a sheet, doesn't say a word to me, gets in the car, leaves. I don't hear from him again. Had no idea what went on. It takes me a couple of weeks. What happened is my mom. He walks in, introduces himself. My mom pulls a knife on the guy. I will kill you. You are not going to steal my goddamn son from me. Scares the guy to death. He bugs out. And uh, kind of broke my spirit at that point. You know, I was like, okay. So um, went into, just full-fledged into scams, crimes, everything else. I had already been, when I was a uh, minor, I'd already been kind of brought up on that side of the family with the crimes that they were doing. My mom was, you know, drug trafficking, the pimp stuff, uh, illegally mining coal, um, charity fraud. Illegally mining coal? Yeah, wildcatting coal. coal. So you- um, Can you explain that? (laughs) Yeah, so so to, to properly mine coal, you have to get a permit, all right? Eastern Kentucky, a lot of people don't, they can't afford the permits. You know, they can, they can get them a piece of equipment. Uh, you know, you get a dozer and a loader or whatever you're going to get or an auger or what have you. So you start mining, but you don't get the permit. So you don't have to find, do the, you don't have to pay. Back then it was like $3,500 for a two acre permit or $5,000 for a two acre permit. Let you strip mine the, the, the coal on that. Then you have to pay for the reclamation on top of that. So once you uncover the pit, take the coal out, you have to cover back up the pit sow grass, make sure everything is environmentally friendly. You got oh, wow. a silt pond, everything else at that point. So the whole idea is you buy an acre of land or some area of land, and then you can, there's a whole process you're supposed to go through. To Entire process. The, how many people involved in a mining, the smallest number of people required for a mining operation? You, you can know? do it with three or four people. Okay. So, so you've you got can... your loader operator, you've got your dozer operator. You need, uh, you can you can farm out the trucking to someone if you need that, or, or a trucking company if you need to do that. Um then you've got your whoever owns the business as well. So very few people can run an operation like that and profit fairly well as long as 
you don't have to do the reclamation, all that crap on top of it. All right. The reclamation gets pretty expensive. So if you're uncovering a pit of coal, uh, you know, a, a pit. So a ton of coal is basically about 36 cubic inches is what, what a 2000 pounds of coal weighs if you're in Eastern Kentucky, because it's that the weight of the bituminous coal and everything. The fact else. that you know, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that, you know, exactly <laughs> the volume of a ton of coal i mean it's great yeah you learn this shit right you, you rattle this shit off so uh so you, you uncover the pit and you've got to sell the pit well wh- the thing is is that where are you going to sell the coal well you sell it to one of these other coal tipples that knows that they're buying the shit illegally so back then a ton of coal was uh they'd give you like 36 bucks per yeah. ton is what that is and you'd have to go out and you'd, you'd test the BTUs on it. You'd take a uh, sample to the lab, test the BTUs. You'd take that into the What's company. BTU? Uh, British Thermal Unit. So you'd test how what the BTU on the coal was. How back, pure the coal is. How pure the coal is. What yeah. what what BTU it burns at. Back then, a good a good BTU was around 12.9 was what you'd get. All right. So 12.9 coal, $36 a ton. You'd take that sample over to the, to the coal tipple. They'd say, okay, we'll buy this for you, how many trucks you got or how many tons you got. And you say, this is what we're, what we've got. Then you'd hire the trucking company and where you get it out because, you know, you've got the agents that are, that are looking for you by this point, because the people that, you know, you've, you've, you've bought the rights to whoever the landowner is, you said, you're going to give them, you know, $2 a ton or whatever this is. Well, the other people there, are you paying them off? Or are you not? Well, if you're not paying them off, guess what? They know your ass is mining it illegally. They're going to report you. Well, all of a sudden, you've got all these inspectors that are coming around and everything. And, hey, we know what you're doing. So they're looking for you to get the pit out. So when do you get the pit out? Right in the dead of night. So, you know, you're loading it up 2 o'clock in the morning, hauling it his ass out is what you're doing. You sell it out from there. So um, And your mom ran operations like this? Yeah, yeah. And you said you worked the mine too yeah, when you were younger? Yeah, learned how to run a loader, run a dozer, learned how to clean off a pit, <laughs> everything like that. So this is this is the lifestyle you you grow up in. You know, you learn how to do this stuff. And uh, so knew how to do charity fraud as well, um, insurance fraud. So charity fraud. Can we can we break down some of some of these are charity fraud? It's it's much more romantic than what it sounds. It was basically <laughs> it was basically standing beside the road with a sign and a bucket, yeah, c- taking up collections for homeless shelters, for abused women, for children, stuff like that. Um, then later on, I branched off. I, I, when I started off on my own, I would set up my own charity company and do some telemarketing and go on by and collect checks and things like that. You know, we're going to talk about that. But actually, can we just step back and talk about your mom sure. and your dad? Given all of that, <laughs> given all the abuse, the complex ways that she played with love right. to see how far she can push you and the people around her and they still love her. Today, do you love her? You know, I, I called my dad yesterday. Uh, my dad, he's uh, he's dying now. He's got a heart condition. He's not going to get the operation to fix it. So he's like, fuck it. I'm ready to go. And I'm like, I looked at him because, hell, I'm 52 now. And I, prior to 52, I'd have been like, no, you need to do this. But I looked at him and I was like, I understand. I understand. You're done. And uh, so he's not going to get the operation. I was talking to him yesterday. And he asked me, he's like, have you, have you seen your mom? And I was like, dad, I've not talked to her for about two years. And uh, I told him, I was like, um, I love my mom, but my mom is not a good person. She's not. And uh, he told me, I was talking to him on the phone yesterday, and he told me that it took him several years to really understand that. You know, he loved her too, but it takes, when you're when you're getting abused like that, especially my dad, my dad came from a good family, everything else, and, um, you know, upstanding family. <laughs> and uh, I think that when you're that victim of abuse, you know, you've never seen it before. You've never encountered it, and then it happens. Well, you're like that frog in water all of a sudden. You know, you get to the point where it gradually increases until how do you get out of it? Everybody else sees what's happening, but you don't. Um, I grew up in that environment, though. You know, so it took me a long time to uh, to come to terms with that. My sister came to terms with it long before I did. You know, my sister, she, she's been a decade without talking to my mom. Like, she had tried to commit suicide. I didn't know that. What got me so bad is she said at one point that she always thought someone was going to come in and save us. And my response, just immediate response, not even thinking about it, my response was, well, Denise, I knew no one ever was. 
And mm. looking at things now, I think that's the that's where our paths diverged. Me, it was if you're going to do it, if anybody's going to take care of you, you got to take care of yourself. You're on your own. You're on your own. You know, it's up to you. <laughs> and Denise has always been that 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 child that has expected someone to come in and save her. Well, and almost like it's all going to be okay. Somebody, yeah. And I knew it wasn't. Yeah, no, no, you go unless you <laughs> unless you make it okay. <laughs> it ain't going to be okay. So you know, it was. I, are you able to forgive her, your mom? My my boundary with my mom. The reason I've not spoken with her um, over two years ago, I started um, this this legal career of mine. I, I've been the guy who has. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about my past and those choices and what brought, brought those choices around. So I'm, I'm big about taking responsibility for my actions. I truly am. I think it's really important you have to do that. Well, my mom, eh, not so much. So I was talking to her, you know, and I, I would start saying, you know, she was, she would start the conversation talking about she didn't understand why Denise wouldn't speak to her anymore. That was one of her tropes. So, and my response started to become, well, because you were the abuser and you spent your life doing that to her, so it's more healthy for her not to talk yeah. to you. So she's still not able to see the flaws in, in, the, oh, no. in her ways of the past. No, not at all. So my, my ultimatum to my mom was, look, when you're able to admit that you abuse the people in your life, accept that responsibility, and be able to discuss it with me, we'll have a talk. Other than that, I don't want to talk to you anymore. So for the first year, it was, you know, calling, cussing my wife out, cussing me out. Um, you know, I don't need you, I, blah, 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 blah. And then finally it started to taper off, and she's never really contacted me after that point. Your dad is dying. Yeah. What do you take from the way he's taken on death? Just saying, fuck it. You know, it's the man. And what have you learned from your dad? What do you love about your dad he's one of these guys that uh you know like i told him i told my dad about the about the abuse and everything else and uh, there was a point so you know i told you about the elevator stuff yeah. but before that man it was um it took me 40 years to talk about that but it also took me 40 years to um to talk about there was a point that my mom and dad would leave the house and I would urinate in the floor. All right. And, uh, as a, like, um, out of anger, no, no idea why. All right. But I would piss on the carpet, <laughs> carpet pissers like sure. the Lebowski, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it really tied the room together. Dude. It really tied so, the room together. I was talking about that. And this lady comes up to me after the, uh, after the presentation, and she had she had a career previous to that where she dealt with abused kids. And she told me, she's like, Brett, she's like, um, it's a control mechanism. The only control you had was that. And she's like, kids do that. And I was like, so I'm not unique. She's like, no, you're not unique in that. So um, that, you know, th th this whole history of abuse, Denise dealt with it by drinking, by uh, trying to commit suicide things like that. And then finally she escapes. I'm the kid that didn't. And, and not only that, my wife pointed out to me that it's, again, it's that Eastern Kentucky mentality stuff. You know, the male's expected to do things. So with, with me, it was, it was almost like I stepped up to, to take part in those crimes so that Denise didn't, didn't have to. And she, she was able to avoid all that. Other than that one shoplifting stuff, Denise doesn't break the law anymore. She goes off to be a, she's a, She's a good parent. She's an angry parent. She's a good parent. She's a teacher, uh, good citizen overall. I was just the guy that kept right on going with it. 